My tummy talk, too. It's a feed me. Pretty sure that was a fart, Petrie. Pretty sure. Today we're going to be looking at the second movie of the Land Before Time franchise. If I remember correctly, I think this is actually the first Land Before Time movie I actually saw, and then I had to go back and watch the first one. Having watched the first one and seeing where everything came from, it just hits different. And this brings back a lot of memories. Many eons ago, when the Earth was young, Millions of Here comes a narrator that sounds like Littlefoot's grandfather. He talks about how the dinosaurs were plant eaters, were all okay, and then there were the dreaded sharp teeth, because carnivorous animals are evil. Yo, the way they did the T-Rexes back in the day, they were not doing them any favors. Freaking burnt up Cadillac, broken down tummy oven looking thing. Can you imagine if this thing had feathers? I think it would look more horrifying. I love cocaine! But all is well, because the dinosaurs now live in the Great Valley, where Littlefoot and his friends have now started the very annoying pastime of doing sing-alongs, where everyone just breaks out into songs. Somehow they're so harmonious that every single one of them know the lyrics to that song that they're all singing for the first time. Is reminding me. Before time so much and it wasn't so nostalgic i'd be stabbing my ears out right now after they all symbolically look over the great valley of their past achievements and how they became friends littlefoot's grandfather calls him oh my god in my fan fiction parallel universe gourmet littlefoot's grandfather is such a freaking asshole he's freaking hilarious after the monster season is over i will definitely go and cover the land before time because i miss doing that anyway that's my grandpa. Gotta go. I know that was for the benefit of the audience because I'm pretty sure Sarah, Ducky, Petrie, and Spike all know that's your grandfather, Littlefoot. Why are we still singing the song? <laughs> Why is Littlefoot running like he's being puppeteered? Littlefoot catches up to his grandfather. I remember when I was younger and I used to be so concerned with them stepping on Littlefoot. Like, what if he trips and accidentally squishes Littlefoot? I mean, the baby dinosaurs in this franchise are really small in comparison to their family. When you compare dogs and other animals, I guess it's the same thing, but... Sauropods aren't exactly known for their elegance and grace of movement. And every other reptilian animal that does have very tiny babies like that, the babies are usually hatched in vast numbers, so if some of them die, it doesn't matter. And they usually are born without the parents there, and as far away from the parents as possible. Hello, little foot. Come eat your breakfast. Okay, I'm hungry. I mean, is it just me, or are there not plants everywhere? I've seen the plants that Littlefoot and his family eats. You can eat them. They're all they're all over the Great Valley. Maybe it's a communal thing or something, but looking back at this, if you were so hungry, why didn't you just chop off one of the leaves that you usually eat that grow by your house anyway? So you go your life just eat leaf. Why yeah, so man. weak? Around this time, we meet the Struthiomimus brothers, Ozzy and Strut. Pretty accurate so far with the information we know about Struthiomimus, who were thought to have been omnivores or herbivores or even egg-eating and insect-eating dinosaurs. I feel the pain, though, for poor Strut. Don't you, Strut? Strut, get up here! What? It doesn't look too good, though, because Strut looks like he's malnourished in comparison to his brother. But Strut genuinely likes eating plants. And his brother basically shames him every step of the way for that. Spit that stuff out! Go on, spit it out! But Ozzy, I'm hungry! Spit oh. it out! <laughs> Grass guzzler! No brother of mine is going to eat vegetation! <laughs> Not while I'm around. Even when I was younger, I used to wonder, what is it to you if he eats grass? He doesn't get mad at you for wanting to eat eggs, so why are you getting all bent out of shape because he wants to eat grass? Also, I don't know if it's just me, but I notice a difference in their accent. Strut, the younger brother who seems to be being shamed by his upperclassman brother, has more of a Cockney, West Country British accent, while Ozzy seems to speak the Queen's English. You know that way of speaking where everything is articulated and you sound like one of the royals, like this. I don't know if they did that by design, but it almost seems as though Ozzy, the brother, grew up in affluence and he looks down on his brother that didn't. Or he thinks he's better than him, so he is of the right to set the standard of what they are allowed to do or what his brother is allowed to do. Anyway, Littlefoot and his grandfather eat. His grandfather gives him the last tree star. Remember tree stars from the Verse movie? Wink, wink. Littlefoot's grandfather does a trick with the tree and tells him that old Lonex can do this. So, of course, as is his fashion, Littlefoot tries and almost gets his asshole blown out to pieces. 
is when we discover that the grandfather has a Fantastic Four, Mr. Fantastic abilities with the ability to stretch his freaking neck because we know it's not that freaking long. Like a rubber band, it is literally like contracting to a third its size. And I just realized that watching, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Somehow, if you're a long neck, you can stand a mile away and still be able to talk to your friend as if you're standing right there by only stretching out your neck. Littlefoot is frustrated because he hates being little. He's more mature than he feels, and he just wants to be grown up and not depend on the grown-ups for everything. Right there and then, Sarah calls out to him. Hey, Littlefoot! Come on! Grandpa, can I go play? No, little bitch. You need to teach your pot belly friend some manners. Real talk, though, Sarah didn't even say good morning to his grandfather. And seeing as Littlefoot's grandfather is the one that called him home in the first place, you'd think that she would ask Gourmet if Littlefoot can come out and play. She literally treats him like he's invisible. Hey, Littlefoot. <laughs> Littlefoot's grandfather is relieved and just reminisces and admits that the Great Valley is a wonderful place for the kids to grow up and have fun. The clap of my ass cheeks keeps alerting the guards. <laughs> As the Strithia Mimus brothers are about to steal an egg, a mother, um, Hadrosaurus, Corythosaurus, I have no idea what the frick this big lit dinosaur is supposed to be, doesn't matter. She tells Littlefoot and his friends that her nest is down there and they're kicking rocks down there. Instead of taking their playtime somewhere else, they get all bent out of shape and say it wasn't much fun and they're bored. You have acres upon acres of play places to go and play. But instead of doing that, they decide that they're gonna play. I know, I know. We could go to the sheltering grass and play sharp tooth attack. <laughs> <laughs> At first they're okay with this, but Sarah's like, uh, nah, uh. Not if I have to be the sharp tooth again. They take advantage of Spike being so simple and they're like, okay, he'll be the sharp tooth and they decide to go. Littlefoot, however, has a problem with this. You see, his grandparents had told him that he's not allowed to go there without them and made him promise. Sarah is like, you guys are a bunch of babies. And she claims that she can cross a sinking sand with her eyes closed. And not looking where she is going? Yes, Ducky, that's what that means. So the group of friends all go there and act as though they've never been there before when clearly they have several times. The sinking sand. Yes, Littlefoot. Thank you for articulating that to everyone. We couldn't tell by just looking at it. And since everybody else has already seen it, I'm pretty sure they understand what it is. Hmm. Uh, uh, I cannot swim in this. Oh no. No, no, no! Why would you think about swimming in it when it's already been established that you guys played there before and you had to hop across the rocks? I'm so confused. Like, back then when you're watching this stuff, of course, it's all good fun. And I know it's just a cartoon, but it's still stupidly hilarious when you go back and watch it when you're older and you're like, but didn't y'all just say that you went over there before? Like, that... You wouldn't put that in your mind as an idea to go play had you not been there before. Everyone was like, yeah! But maybe they hadn't been there before, and this was just a novel idea. Oh. Petrie, fly across! Thanks for that, Petrie. As all the other friends so eloquently put it, they don't have wings, numbnuts, so you can fly across. But they clearly cannot. I love how Petrie's always so not helpful. I love the Land Before Time characters, but I think Petrie's my least favorite, which is why he got killed off in my world. Poor Petrie. <laughs> Look at Spike's face. Yo, Spike. Spike. Well, his face says everything everybody's thinking. Oh, oh, Petrie, just fly across. Boy, if you don't. <laughs> Sarah decides that she's just gonna go jump across. Just like her dad. Pee. You know, when you're about to prove something to other people, make sure it's flawless. Make sure you think it through, because I'm sure Sarah was thinking, I'm gonna show those guys, I'm gonna show them that I'm the bravest, and I'm glad that they kept her character from the first movie. Unfortunately, her pitfall was she had way too much pride and not enough smarts. Huh? You see? Whoa! As you can imagine, things do not turn out the way they expect. <laughs> and even when I was younger, I remember watching this scene and just thinking to myself, are they insane? Like, even, even if you're like a little kid, there's just certain things 
that, you know, certain levels of common sense that you would have at that age. And they're still really young dinosaurs, but they are dinosaurs. But there was just, a, there were just some seeds in here that just threw me for a freaking loop. Even looking back at it now, it cracks me up every time. Hey! Can we appreciate how Ducky made that jump just to save her friend? Ducky, no you don't, honey. You're trying to pull her horn off her face. You're- there's no leverage. If anything, you're- <laughs> If anything, you're making her sink faster. Dude, look at- look at poor Sarah. Get the shit off me! <laughs> Dedication and the thought that counts has no bearing on a situation where you can literally lose your life. And that's not the only thing. All the others come in to help, and then they all fall in. How, though? Because when we look at Petrie, who can fly, I had to wonder to myself, even when I was really young, and I'm like, is there, like, a gravitational pull in the tar? Because Petrie can fly. By now, he's an expert flyer. <laughs> and as he's pulled into the quicksand, he almost gets pulled straight in. But let's go at the last minute. He could have flown away and gotten help for his friends. Instead, he throws himself in the... Sorry. <laughs> he throws himself into the quicksand. It doesn't matter at what age or how many times I end up watching this. I always wonder my, to myself, what is the purpose of even having Petrie in the group if he can't even exercise the one option that he has? You know, that everybody doesn't, and that's to freaking fly. I asked one of my friends this when we were really young, and we were, like, wondering what happened. And I asked, I'm like, why didn't he just fly away? He didn't get pulled into the quicksand. He dropped in there himself. Why didn't he fly away to go get help? And she was like, well, he didn't want to leave his friends. So he'd rather die with them instead of getting the grown-ups to come and help them. It just made no sense. The grown-ups finally make it there, and they all sink individually. But somehow, when Littlefoot's grandfather pulls them all out, they are instinctively all holding on to each other while they're dying. So you mean to tell me, while they all were drowning, their number one, their number one instinct was to clamp onto the person's next to you's tail instead of climbing on top of them. How did you know? Whatever. Littlefoot utters the most stupid statement ever. We made it! Only to find a whole bunch of angry parents and grandparents looking down back at them. Littlefoot's grandfather gives him the whole Mufasa Simba speech, saying how, you know, you could have been lost today, and while it's safe here in the Great Valley, there are still dangers. The Great Wall around the Great Valley protects us from the mysterious beyond. Which is not so mysterious, since you guys came from there not long ago, but okay. You must always be careful. But my friends... Hush now. That's Migor's, his grandmother's, very polite way of saying, Shut the fuck up. You're a fucking cunt. In the middle of the night, Sarah wakes up Littlefoot and tells him to gather the group because they've got to talk. She asks them if they all got the same lecture, and they all say how their parents said that they should always be careful, that they're too young, that they're not grown-ups yet, and Sarah shares a lecture her father gave her as well. Don't hang around with long necks, big faces, and spike tails. I don't know why that's racist, but that's, that's, that's racist. I don't know why. Sarah has the insane idea for them to run away from home because she's sick and tired of the grown-ups treating them like they're babies, which they are. So she says that they could just stay up here, not really having a well-thought-out plan. Littlefoot thinking they can just be snuck up on is assured by Sarah that they are protected by these rocks and that they can in fact see everything. It's at this moment that Littlefoot agrees, but then sees Ducky's nest. From way up top, they can see two mysterious dinosaurs walking away from the nest. Littlefoot responsibly is like, we gotta wake up the grown-ups, come on, let's go. Ducky's like, yeah, let's go. But then Sarah jumps in the way and she's like, wait a minute, if we catch them ourselves, then we won't be treated like babies anymore. And then Ducky's like, yeah, because she's always agreeing with everything everybody else has to say in that moment. Sarah's convinced it's a good idea because, you know, the wonderful line of thinking. There's five of us and only two of them. What could go wrong? Yeah, Sarah. What could go wrong? I, I'm not... Uh. Ah!
there's a big rock slide and a whole bunch of confusion. And somehow during this confusion, the egg just magically rolls back into its original nest. I remember thinking the rock slide scene was so fun. Anyway, the group almost falls into like what looks like stomach acid and rotting corpses. And during this time, I think they realize that they're in the mysterious beyond, a bit farther from home than they should be. <laughs> This place spooky. Yeah, because there's a literal Chinese dragon like swimming through that freaking boiling acid like it's nobody's business. Spooky is not the word I would use. The gang knows they're in the mysterious beyond. And for the first time, Sarah actually seems scared and says she wants to go home. But Ducky can't just leave her baby brother or sister. Littlefoot then says that the egg might have gotten smushed in that big old rock slide. Ducky starts crying because that was gonna be her baby brother and sister. Littlefoot comforts her saying, hey, it's just a, it's just a circle of life. You know how it is, bro. So freaking heartless, but he's right. And then Sarah adds in to add insult to injury. Besides, there's a whole nest full of eggs at home. Yeah, Ducky, cheer up. It's okay that your little baby brother or sister got kidnapped and then killed. But it's all good, because you've got other baby brothers and sisters. Understandably, this isn't cheer Ducky up, and she claims that egg was special, and it was going to be her favorite, and there's no other egg like this, instead of this egg that she didn't see before that happened to me in the shadows that looks just like the egg that was from her nest. The whole group noticed that the egg is bigger, but they're just so glad it's safe, and they have to carry it home. They make the flimsiest egg carrier I have ever seen in my life. I mean, it would have made sense if Ducky and Petrie had the egg between them and held it while on Spike's back or on Sarah's back, holding it under her frill. But what do I know? Since I've watched over my favorite franchise, I realize that these kids are pretty stupid. Ducky rolls back her sibling like she's changing a tire. And I swear, I just now got this part of the movie. Talk about stupid. When I was younger, I had no idea what this meant. Remember how the group remarked that the egg was bigger? Well, when she puts it back, she realizes, wait a minute, the egg is back. Look, I thought she was talking about the large egg. And the reason she was exclaiming was because it was so out of place and how different it looked than the others. <gasps> Go on, Ducky, put it back. It is back. Look. And in that young age, I couldn't understand why they were showing just the nest with the small eggs. But they even said it in the scene after. And this is a movie I have watched literally like 60 times. Littlefoot voices what everybody else is thinking. If Ducky's egg was there the entire time, no matter how it got back there somehow, nobody asked that important question, whose egg is this? Clearly, it doesn't belong to Ducky's family. Bear still wants to keep things between all of them because they want to be treated like grown-ups, and they make the decision that they're going to take care of the baby. After all, we're not babies. Meanwhile, the Strength of Mimus brothers, Strut and Ozzy are, well, more so Ozzy, is very upset because those kids, those meddling kids, cost them their lunch for the last time. The egg starts hatching. The group is excited until they realize what hatches from the egg. Shit! They all run away just in time, yelling out Sharptooth, and the Strathia Mimus brothers were about to attack them. Everyone freaks out, and Lilfa tries to get away, but once again his neck is caught in the vines, a call back to the first movie. He is scared off, but stops long enough to realize that the baby isn't coming after them. He decides that the baby isn't so bad after all, and is probably not even dangerous. Baby thinks that he is his father. You okay? <sighs> You're gonna have to be more careful. Littlefoot tries to be gentle, but he realizes that hmm, taking care of a baby is not so easy, and you do have to set certain rules for them to be kept safe. He asks advice from his grandparents, because he quickly has forgotten that this is a sharp tooth that eats other living things. Littlefoot is getting advice, little baby dinosaur is chasing insects away. I was cracking up when, <laughs> when Littlefoot was talking to his grandparents, because he literally just dropped a freaking conversational bomb on them that every parent's like, what the F? Littlefoot literally comes out of nowhere while his grandparents are just having some supper together. What is it? Well, um, I want to know about babies. Oh shit, Gourmet, it's the talk. I told you this would happen. Did he get someone pregnant? No, maybe he's pregnant. How is he pregnant, Gourmet? He's a boy child. Did you actually look underneath him to check? Gourmet! Just tell him to tell the girl it's not his. Gourmet! Littlefoot, 
You are too young to worry about babies. Tell that to my dick, Grandma. Look at your foot. I just kidding, bitch. <laughs> Littlefoot asks his grandparents an oddly very specific question, and then is like, "All right, that's all I wanted to know," and runs off. And they don't feel suspicious at all. Littlefoot's friends return to the hatching site to realize that their friend is gone, thinking that the sharp tooth ate him. Like I said, because they're freaking stupid. Before they can get a chance to mourn, the Struthia Minus Eggnappers are back. These were the same guys that these group of friends were chasing before, and Sarah has completely forgotten about her numbers equation. All of them versus only two of these guys? Isn't the plant grazers who spoiled our supper? It is the egg stealers! Run! Ah! Where's my egg, you rotten little sp- What's wrong, Sarah? I mean, Littlefoot's no longer in the equation, but you're a big old badass three-horn, right? Like Daddy said. Don't you know how to take care of yourself, Sarah? Littlefoot comes back seconds after that whole mayhem just left after his friends were screaming, and it makes me wonder how we never heard his friends screaming, but oh well. He realizes that Chomper, what he called the sharp tooth, baby T-Rex, is gone and goes to find him, and finds him in a very perilous situation. Chomper, please! I don't want to lose you! Chomper's just having fun and doesn't realize the danger. This is the same place where Littlefoot and his friends almost died, and when Chomper comes back, Littlefoot gives him a scolding. Same like what his grandparents did to him. Shortly after, Littlefoot hears his friends calling for help and realizes they're in trouble. They're being threatened to be thrown off a cliff by the Agnappers. Littlefoot firmly tells Chomper to stay where he is and that he means it. Ozzy, the egg-napping, egg-eating brother, is very upset, while Strut just thinks it was just an egg. Apparently because there's nothing else in the Great Valley that these dudes can eat. Watching this later on, I realized he wasn't even going to do anything to them. He was basically just telling them to stay out of his way or else he'll do something and never said what it was because Littlefoot came to save the day. Just what I can't stand. A bossy weed whacker. <laughs> Thanks for the vote of confidence, Littlefoot. Thanks. Now we completely believe that you're there to save us. How are you going to sit there putting up a brave ass face and then getting scared when he comes towards you? What did you think was going to happen? But then they see a huge shark tooth shadow on the wall and get freaked out, as does Littlefoot and his friends. Fearing for their lives, the Struthia Mimuses jump off the cliff and get hurt while they realize that it's Chomper. His shadow was only large enough to look like a sharp tooth because of the trick of the light or what have you. Littlefoot and his friends sing another stupid sing-along song titled, We're a Family and You're One of Us Now. And a chopper, though you look like you, we think you like us too because we're a family and you're one of us now. That's until his family starts to look a little too tasty. You're one of us now. <laughs> he bit me! Sarah, feeling the pain, literally in her backside, says that a shark tooth can never be one of them. She takes it back. She does what a three horn does and starts fighting Littlefoot and obviously wins. Because if you put a triceratops against a sauropod, more often than not, the apatosaurus is going to lose. We can't keep him, and that's final! Littlefoot tries to appeal to Sarah, saying that Chomper is a baby, and regardless, he needs them. In the meantime, Petrie is loving on Chomper. Ducky comes in between them and tells Chomper no. He is not allowed to eat Petrie, even though he looks kind of like the insects that Chomper eats. No! Huh? Huh? I said no, just like my parents. Oh, no, no, no. Another thing I thought was hilarious is, and I think a lot of people miss this, I miss this a lot too, but is how the foreground characters just start sliding randomly from one place to another without moving their feet. <laughs> it's something I've noticed happening from the first Land Before Time. I just thought it was hilarious. And Littlefoot has a nerve to tell the infant sharp tooth that was just born that he cannot be a sharp tooth because sharp teeth are not allowed in this, this valley. Can you imagine someone telling you that? Like being a different color or a different whatever. And then they're just like, you know, I'm sorry. You just, you know, you can't be of Hispanic descent because Hispanic people aren't allowed here. Even though it's not your freaking fault that you were born there and these people carried you there. Such an ignorant thing to say to a baby. What the hell is Chopper supposed to do? Instead of disciplining him and saying, hey, you can't, you can eat other stuff, but you can't eat your family. They straight up shame him for what he is. That's like being, look, we're all vegan people here, but you were born a carnivore? Um, you can't be a carnivore and live in my house. No, you cannot be a dog, even though I purchased a dog as a pet. 
knowing what they fucking eat. And you cannot be a dog and live in my house and eat meat. No, you eat vegetables for the rest of your life, bitch. But I knew full well you were a carnivorous, omnivorous animal, but I chose to get you anyway and forced you to eat what you don't eat naturally. I always thought that was so annoying, but looking back at it now, it's like straight up abuse. Maybe not physical, but emotional, verbal, that's like kind of messed up for a little thing that just started his life. As far as Chopper knows as well, these are his parents. So the only people he's ever known that he thinks loves him or should love him are telling him that he should not be what he is and he's wrong. Well, his real parents are looking for him, and oh boy, they've tracked down his scent to the Great Valley. Lilith and his friends look for Chomper, even Sarah feels bad. Well, I really don't care if we find him or not. I take that back. Soon after, they do find Chomper, and of course, just in Chomper fashion, on the freaking volcano in the middle of danger, he's chasing down a dragonfly because nobody is feeding the poor little thing. I mean, what are they supposed to feed him themselves? While those truth you minuses are trying to get food, they hear the kids calling out Chomper's name and get spooked and almost fall off the cliff. Unfortunately for them, the mother of the eggs spots them trying to steal her babes. I don't know why, but this scene always freaking cracked me up. Every time I watch it, I laugh because of the sound the mother makes. <laughs> because of the sound the mother makes. And Ozzy and Strutt are trying to run for, <laughs> run for their lives. <laughs> And then she's like, ah! <laughs> I don't know why, why that part cracks me up. Ever since the first time I saw that movie, till now, it just freaking gets me giggles. I don't know why. It's the way it sounds. It's freaking amazing. Ozzy and his brother corner the kids and threaten to push them into the hot boiling water. And Sarah decides to call their bluff, saying that they're friends with a very mean sharp tooth. Chomper hears this and automatically knows that his family's in danger. Or maybe it's just because he hears their voice and he's like, hmm, I wonder what's going on. They came to find me? Ozzy doesn't believe them and says, if you're friends with a sharp tooth and sharp teeth don't have friends, prove it. Strut even says, yeah, I believe him because we saw a shadow. And Sarah's dumbass comes out and is like, uh, that wasn't a real shark tooth. That was just a baby. Sarah? I mean, oops. Sarah ain't so bright, is she? Like, she's bright when it comes to fighting and stuff and survival. But in this specific social thing, I mean, I don't know. She has her moments where she's just like incredibly smarter than everybody else in the voice of reason. And then these other moments where she's just so freaking incredibly stupid. There is a fan fiction I want to upload at some point in time with Littlefoot and Mario and they all go to Mario World. <laughs> it's so freaking, though. I don't want to spoil it. Then why'd you bring it up, Altieri? I don't know, just to be mean. Volcano gets really angry. Everyone splits up and the kids try to run away, but the truth is for some reason, even though lava is literally flowing moments away from them, corners the kids. Huh? Ah! Chopper! Chopper is reunited with his family, but the truth is are intent on killing the children or whatever they're gonna do with them. And Littlefoot has this anime moment when he thinks back on how he hated being little and his grandpa said that you'll grow up soon enough and then that gives him the power to push an already rotten tree onto its side. The kids make it, but Ozzy ends up falling down into the ravine and his brother just jumps after him. The lack of intelligence in these characters is the gift that keeps on giving. And while the kids think everything is over, unfortunately, there's a loud roar and they find these two Tyrannosauruses, which from the get, I know are Chomper's parents. Littlefoot's grandparents are freaked out because sharp teeth are not supposed to be in the valley and they can hear them roaring. They go to warn the other adults. It's obviously, <laughs> it's obviously a sense of urgency, but the way they walk off is like, we gotta go, we gotta go tell the others, come on. And then they move in like slow motion. In the valley? must warn the others. With the speed draw are walking, you might as well summon the power to make your neck three times the size of your body like you did earlier on. After Littlefoot and his friends momentarily lose the sharp teeth, Littlefoot says it was their fault because they caused the rock slide that tore a hole in the Great Valley Wall, allowing the sharp teeth to come in. Then Littlefoot hears a horrible cry. It's the sound of his grandpa roaring. Or at least that's what we're supposed to be. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why it's funny, but it's what we're supposed to be hearing. And I heard it and I'm like, oh, that sounds like a really old ass long neck. And then I'm hearing it again after not watching this movie for many years and goddamn. 
It honestly sounds like someone guzzled down some carbonated drink and let let a burp rip because that was the ugliest sounding dinosaur call I've ever heard in this entire franchise. <laughs> After Littlefoot sees his grandfather in trouble, he's like, I gotta do something. Sarah is like, he's a grown up. What the frick are you gonna do? And I can understand where Littlefoot's coming from. And this is really interesting character development because if you recall, having watched the first movie, Littlefoot's mother fought a shark tooth to try and save Littlefoot and his friends and she was killed. There goes a slippity sliding feet again. Why bother animating their feet getting picked up when you could just slide them across the screen? <laughs> Luckily for Gourmet, Petrie's mom ends up distracting the sharp tooth to give him time to get away. Littlefoot and Chomper devise a plan to trip the sharp tooth as she's walking towards the flyer. During this time, the friends do everything in their power to outwit the sharp teeth. It's like these creatures have a freaking vendetta. <laughs> I notice a lot of the very old movies use that stupid dinosaur roar for every major monster or dinosaur. It's so annoying every time I hear it. But I also notice that the design for the T-Rexes were very old. How they used to believe that T-Rexes stood like on their tails and whatnot and standing upright like Godzilla. What I found really cool is when the grownups finally stepped in and tried to help the kids or tried to run the sharp teeth away from the Great Valley and they were just kicking ass together. Notice they were all working together. They were like, get away from our kids. And this is the time when Sarah appreciated her father and cheered him on as he was really kicking the sharp teeth's ass. Look at the grownups go. Get him, Papa. After defeating the two T-Rexes, the grown-ups cheer in the most comic book fashion ever. And you're happy for them until someone says fucking hooray. <laughs> Who says that? Uh, except for when people are like, hip hip, hooray, hip hip, hooray. And it's like a chant. Nobody said, like nobody in everyday life, even I'm guessing back then, because this was, what, this was from 1990? Nobody talked like that, or did they? I've never heard someone just be like, hooray! Like, that's not something that people say. It's weird. Seems like the kids have had enough of being grown-ups themselves and all run to their parents. I did notice that there was a spike tail there, an adult stegosaurus. Mm-hmm, Mrs. Yushin, where's Mr. Yushin? Where's Papa Ducky? Or did they just make a mistake and they were like, well, Spike's a spike tail, so we gotta put an adult spike tail there. Unless Ducky's mom is, you know, co-parenting. I was gonna say co-parenting with the spike tail. Or somebody made a mistake in the studio. Maybe he's just there to help because everyone likes seeing the Stegosaurus. It just, just found it kind of odd. After all of that, the grown-ups are like, how the frick did Sharp Teeth get in here? This never happened before. Kids, you wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? Ducky just straight up lies like a little innocent angel because people will believe her. Littlefoot's grandmother looks at him like, Littlefoot, you don't know, do you? All sweet-like. Littlefoot? I, uh, um, um. Sarah? Well, um, see? Bitch, you better back your stanky ass neck up off my child looking at her like that. Notice grandma's looking all freaking. What the hell is wrong with you, grandma? You didn't look at Littlefoot like that, but then you're coming now with the force and grace of God looking at Sarah like that. What is your problem? Look at that mean mug on her face. Like, what the hell? Look at, <laughs> look at Sarah's father. His eyes have no color in them. He looks like Pinhead. No wonder Sarah ended up spilling the juice. Lucky for them, they don't get in trouble, but they do notice after a while when the grown-ups decide to go and concoct a plan to close up the hole that Chomper's been missing this whole time. Maybe that's a good thing, because after what the grown-ups had to go through, I don't think they'd look too kindly on them having a baby T-Rex in the mints. The shark teeth are on their way out, and Littlefoot finds Chomper, but so do the shark teeth. When Littlefoot gets stuck in a log and tells Chomper to go on, Chomper doesn't leave him. And this is honestly the sweetest part in the entire movie because since Chomper came into the scene, I was hoping that at some point the Sharp Teeth would discover that Chomper is their baby and the Sharp Teeth would be friendly with the dinosaurs in the Great Valley because they took care of Chomper. And I was just, it was heavily predictable to me, to be honest. <laughs> And Chomper is trying to talk to the T-Rexes. Obviously, they can understand each other. And then he roars back at them to be intimidating. And that's when they realize that this is their baby. Don't know why it took Chomper getting angry for them to realize that. 
since I figured since they looked high and low for their one child, they would learn how to recognize the smell of their own offspring, but whatever. <laughs> are fugly but how cute littlefoot recognizes that these are chomper's parents don't know why that ever entered his head in the first place being that they stole an egg and it hatched into this and now these two other sharp teeth came to the great valley and that never once clicked no okay but regardless the two sharp teeth lovingly walk off with their son and littlefoot pulls his foot out you couldn't do that before littlefoot oh mom and papa t-rex are walking with their son back home chomper hears littlefoot crying for help the two T-Rexes look at their baby, wondering what the frick he's doing. This time, I can imagine they're not letting him out of their sight. When Chomper finds Littlefoot, the truth of is are hanging him over a cliff. When Chomper shows up, his shadow looks intimidating, but they're not falling for the same trick twice. The truth of is grab Chomper by the neck, which is a horrible mistake, because as you can recall, the parents are nearby. There is an egg. What the? Those two did not make it out alive. Meanwhile, Chomper gets to say an official goodbye to Littlefoot. Littlefoot pushes Chomper to go back and meet up with his parents. They're closing the hole to the Great Valley, and Chomper can't be left behind. I can't take care of you anymore, Chomper. I'm... I'm just a kid. I know. I'll miss you too. Oh, how cute! Littlefoot meets back up with the rest of the people in the Great Valley. His grandpa asks if he was sure that he saw the sharp teeth leave. Littlefoot confirms this. Gourmet is not really angry with Littlefoot, but calls him out and saying that Littlefoot disobeyed him. He says one day he'll understand why his grandmother and him worry about him so much. Having gone through all of that with Chomper, Littlefoot says that he understands. To which the grandfather replies that he'll stay close to the herd then, if he understands. And Littlefoot says nothing, and we know what that means. More adventures. Gourmet allows Littlefoot to help the others close up the wall so he feels like part of the group, like part of the grown-ups. And once again, the Great Valley is sealed off and safe. Finally, Littlefoot can be a kid again with his friends. I think they all learned the valuable lesson that day. Pull out! I decided that I really like being a kid. <laughs> but I still can't wait to grow up. <laughs> and it's so sweet to see that i think the message is look there are a lot of things that you want to be when you grow up but you should also enjoy your childhood where you have it because when we get old it's not going to be all fun and games there's responsibilities and all of that jazz and youth is something that we should all enjoy while we have it it kind of sucks though because i see a lot of people literally just making themselves older or making themselves old in general by doing a whole bunch of stuff that ages you like super quickly i know friends of mine that are in their 20s and look no shame in it but they have like seven kids they drink they smoke and they look like they're 50 and i'm not trying to brag here but someone literally said to me how is it that you look so young young for your age you look like you're 16 and i said i don't know maybe because i stay inside and i'm a nerd and she asked me if i had kids i said no and her reply was oh that's why <laughs> i felt kind of bad she had like four kids i already decided i didn't want kids at that time but then her saying that and me seeing all these videos of people tearing and being cut open nope that's just not for me it takes very strong people as we've seen in the land before time movie take care of kids and chomper was a good kid it's not even like chomper was bad he was just really hyper and he was just born but then also seeing the shit that Littlefoot and his friends put their parents and guardians through. And I'm like, why do I want to put myself through that? Why do I want to do that? Isn't it selfish to have children if you don't want them just because everyone else thinks you should? I think everyone should make their decision to do what is best for them. And to not rush into having children just because you see somebody else doing it. For this message for Littlefoot, don't rush into trying to do everything the adults are doing because you'll find more often than not that it looks great, but when you actually have all that responsibility, it's not as fun as you thought it looked from your sweet little bubble of childhood.
to close out this video, this has been a speed spate, <laughs> speed spate, <laughs> speed paint of the Quetzal Coatl from Dragon's Nine Realms, the spinoff for How to Train Your Dragon. I thought the dragon designs were kind of weird, but if I were to draw the dragon in my style as I said I would, this is how I would envision it. It started off having hind legs, but it just turned out this way, so that's my version soaring over the jungle canopy with all the leaves flying around. It's when it's so powerful, it causes the trees to lose their leaves and then creates this precipitation of colorful leaves and blossoms everywhere. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. This has been Ultiori. You ask, we answer.